I feel this morning's message ought to start with a health warning. This morning's message can change your life. Now you might say, well isn't that true every week? Well yes it is, because we're preaching from the Word of God. And the Word of God changes lives. But I want to emphasise it this morning, because two weeks ago God gave me this message. And I thought, if I'm going to preach on that message, perhaps I ought to put it into practice first. So I did. And it's changed my life, so that's how I know it can change your life. Okay, I have had an amazing week with God. Um, I'm sorry if you haven't, and that's just annoyed you. Um, and if I hadn't been preaching, I'd have been up here and, and telling you lots of things, but I've, I've sort of got them in my, in my message. Um, what I'm not sure about, and I need to try and explain this, I'm not sure if things have happened that wouldn't have happened, or it's just that the things would have happened anyway, but because I was in the right, I was in tune with God, I noticed and got blessed through them. Um, but I've got a question for you this morning, um, which isn't on Clive's list, and that is, what must I do to be saved? Now we probably associate that question with the jailer in Philippi who when the prison doors were opened and the um, apostles didn't escape, um, came and fell on his knees and said, and asked them the, this question, what must I do to be saved? But actually that question was very important in the early church. And in particular, as we shall see this morning, in the church at Antioch. So although we're, um, we're going to look at Acts chapter 15, um, we're going to start halfway through Acts chapter 11 just to give a little bit of quick background uh, about the church in Antioch. Um, Antioch, and I didn't realise this until I looked it up, Antioch was the third largest city in the Roman Empire after Rome and Alexandria. Had a population probably, they estimate, of about half a million people. It was the capital of the Roman province of Syria. And within the city there were a number of temples to various gods, as were common at that time, and there was also a temple dedicated to the worship of the emperor. And it also had amphitheatres and so on, and held um, sort of competitions, a bit like the Olympic Games and, and that type of thing. It was a thriving, large, busy city. Acts chapter 11, verse 19. Now those who had been scattered by the persecution in connection with Stephen travelled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus and Antioch telling the message only to Jews. So this is how the church in Antioch started. There were those who were, who were um, moving out of Jerusalem because of the persecution that was there, and they came to Antioch and they preached the gospel among the Jews. Some of the Jews believed in Jesus, and that was the start of the church in Antioch. And then it says, some of them, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, went to Antioch and began to speak to the Greeks, the Gentiles, also, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. The Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. And so what started as a church among the Jews then saw a spiritual awakening among the Gentiles. And so the church in Jerusalem, which was where the church had started, they heard of this and they sent Barnabas to find out what was going on. And Barnabas recognised that this was good and that it was of God, that God was moving among the Gentiles and bringing them to faith in Jesus. And I think, it doesn't specifically say this, but I think that Barnabas then said, well, what are we going to do with all these people who are getting saved? 
Because you see, they didn't just want to make converts, they want to make mature disciples. Just as you know, we have there, that we may present everyone mature in Christ. Now a few years earlier, Barnabas had met somebody called Paul. And he goes to Tarsus to find Paul. Why does he go to get Paul? As I said, he'd met him a few years earlier. Paul, I and mean, we keep repeating this in Acts, and Paul mentions it in some of his letters. Paul knew that God had called him to a ministry to the Gentiles. So I'm sure that he mentioned this to Barnabas because he was always mentioning it. And Barnabas thinks, Saul, Paul, ministry to the Gentiles. But also, I wonder if Barnabas saw it as a possibility for Saul as a training ground. But above all, I believe this, because it says this of Barnabas, he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith. And I believe it was the Holy Spirit's prompting of Barnabas that said, go and get Saul. Bring him here to minister with you to these people. And so that's what he did. And so for a year in, in Antioch, Paul and Barnabas ministered to the church, to the Jews and to the Gentiles, bringing them into a place of maturity. And it says this, the disciples were first called Christians at Antioch. Now it's thought that it was probably a slightly derogatory term, a bit like you know, Bible bashers, Holy Joes, Happy Clappies, that type of thing. But nonetheless it shows us that this group of people, these Christians, as they called them, were getting their own identity. Because the church had begun as, a, as really as a Jewish church. We've mentioned this before. Jesus was a Jew. The disciples were Jews. The people who got saved on the day of Pentecost were Jews. That's why they were in Jerusalem. We see that the first people to get saved in Antioch are Jews. But now it's spreading out to the Gentiles. And now they're getting, starting to get their own separate identity apart from Judaism. But also apart from the community in Antioch. Now I just want to share something that I shared at the prayer meeting on Wednesday. Because we should be standing out with our own identity as Christians in this community. And the question is, do we make a difference? And the answer is yes we do because it's not up to us. But I want to share a story of something that happened to me on Tuesday night. Tuesday night I was in a meeting and there was somebody in the meeting who 15 years ago I was on a committee with this lady over in March. I know it was 15 years ago because it was planning events for the celebration of the millennium in 2000. <coughs> and for about two years we met once a month planning these events and she came up to me at the end of the meeting because I've not really seen her to talk to since then, for 15 years. She came up to me at the end of the meeting. She said, do you remember when we were on that committee together? And I said, yes. And she said, I wonder what she was going to say, you know, what she was going to remember. Do you remember we planned this or we did that or so and so who was on the committee and so on. She said, do you remember that at that time my sister was taken seriously ill and you said you'd pray for her? And she said to me, thank you, she got better. She's 84 now and she's still going strong. Isn't that amazing? Not that she got better, but from 15 years ago, that is the thing that that lady remembered. That was what was at the forefront of her mind. And amongst all this committee stuff, she remembered that I'd prayed for her sister. Yeah, I didn't. I've forgotten. Yeah. I'd made a difference. And I didn't know for 15 years. Yeah. And how many times do we make a difference and we never know? 
but God knows. But the important thing is, we are there making a difference. And that's what these people began to do in Antioch. They began to make a difference. Then after about a year, we have this in Acts chapter 13. In the church at Antioch there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menaean, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshipping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. And so off they went on, on what we now know as Paul's first missionary journey <coughs> to Cyprus and then up into the southern part of Asia Minor, the southern part of the area that we now know as Turkey. Visiting towns, cities such as Lystra, Derby, and just to confuse it all, another town called Antioch. Antioch in Pisidia. <coughs> and please, you know, go home, read this for yourselves. But just, just one thing I want to bring out of this, and that is to look at what they did when they went to each place. Because they went first to the Jews, they went to the synagogues. <coughs> and spoke in the synagogues and some Jews got saved and some Jews opposed them. <coughs> and then they went and preached to the Gentiles. Some of the Gentiles believed which annoyed the Jews who opposed them even more. And we find that there are Jews following them around from one city to another trying to disrupt their ministry. And in fact, at one point, they stoned Paul. And they only stopped stoning him when they thought he was dead. So it wasn't just, you know, fling a few pebbles in his direction. This was serious stuff. And so they worked through these cities. And actually, if you look on the map, you can see as they're working through these cities, they're actually heading back towards Antioch in Syria. And then they do a remarkable thing. They get to one place and Paul says, right, we're going back again. We're going to revisit all the places we've been. We're going to establish these churches. We're going to appoint elders. What he's actually said is, I'm going back to the people who stoned me. I'm taking this risk for the sake of the believers. For the sake of establishing these churches. And eventually, after about a year and a half, they returned to the church in Antioch, in Syria. And of course, they report back everything that's gone on. In Acts chapter 14, verse 27, on arriving back in Antioch, they gathered the church together and reported all that God had done through them, and how he had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. And they stayed there a long time with the disciples. And then that brings us to Acts chapter 15, which is what I'm supposed to be speaking on. Okay, so Acts chapter 15, it says, Some men came down from Judea to Antioch and were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised, according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. Can I just say that these were not representatives of the mainstream church in Judea. These were people on the fringe. These were people who it would appear from what it says later on had been Pharisees, Jewish teachers of the law. They had become converted to, to belief in Jesus. But they believed that in order for a non-Jew, a Gentile, to become a Christian, they first had to become a Jew. So you can imagine in this church in Antioch, where there are now lots of Gentiles who have been taught in their faith by Paul and Barnabas, these people coming along and saying, you're not actually saved. You've never even started the journey. You can imagine the disruption 
and the upset that causes. No wonder that it says that this brought Paul and Barnabas into sharp dispute with them. And remember, Paul himself had been a Pharisee. And so they were considering this question. What must I do to be saved? And it all seemed confusion. And so it was decided that they would go up to the main church in Jerusalem, that both sides would present their case, and the matter, the dispute would be resolved. And so, as we read on, we find that um, verse 6, it says, the apostles and elders met to consider this question. This is in Jerusalem now. After much discussion, Paul, Peter, sorry, got up and addressed them. Brothers, you know that some time ago God made a choice among you that the Gentiles might hear from my lips the message of the gospel and believe God who knows the heart showed them that he accepted them by giving the Holy Spirit to them just as he did to us. He made no distinction between us and them for he purified their hearts by faith. And you may remember that we've talked before about Peter and the vision that God gave him to show him that the Gentiles were not unclean. And that he went to the house of Cornelius and that as they spoke of the gospel to Cornelius and his household, the Holy Spirit fell on them, showing God's approval. And so this is what Peter is referring to here. He's saying it doesn't matter what we think, what matters is what God thinks. What matters is what God has done. And we have seen God do it. Circumcision to the Jewish male was an outward sign of an inner commitment. A commitment to the law, a commitment to the sacrificial system, a commitment to the food laws, a commitment to the festivals and feasts of the Jewish religion that God had established in his covenants with Abraham and with Moses. So that was what the, these uh, former Pharisees were saying the Gentiles had to sign up to before they could accept Christ. And Peter says, Now then, why do you try to test God? By putting on the necks of the disciples a yoke that neither we nor our fathers have been able to bear. Yes? Because he said we, the Jews couldn't stick to it. The Jews couldn't follow it. The Jews couldn't get it right. And now you want to impose it on the Gentiles. Because you see, one of the purposes of the law that God gave in the Old Testament was to show that we cannot do it on our own. And in fact, a Jewish rabbi, when teaching his students about the law, would often use this illustration of taking on a yoke. And that they were yoked to the law in this commitment. And Peter said, why do you want to put that yoke on the Gentiles that we couldn't bear? And what did Jesus say? My yoke is easy. Yes, because compared to that it is. Because Jesus is yoke, he has done it all. And all we have to do is accept and believe. <coughs> my yoke is easy, Jesus said. And my burden is light. Jesus 
Jesus came, he said, to fulfill the law. By that he meant the sacrificial law of the old covenant. You see, the Pharisees, these former Pharisees were trying to tie in the Gentiles to the former sacrificial law when the Jews didn't even need it any longer. Because Jesus died and rose again. Imposing this yoke upon the Gentiles, somebody has said would have made it impossible for them to continue to live within their Gentile communities. And one of the reasons for that is that the Pharisees regarded the Gentiles as unclean. Content, contact with the Gentiles was defiling, the Pharisees said, to a Jew. And then, then have Peter, having made this point. James speaks up. And he quotes from the prophets, mainly from Isaiah, Amos and Isaiah. After this I will return and rebuild David's fallen temple, uh, fallen tent. Its ruins I will rebuild and I will restore it, that the remnant of men may seek the Lord and all the Gentiles who bear my name, says the Lord, who does these things that have been known for ages. It is my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. <coughs> so Peter has spoken from the point of view of what God is doing. And James speaks from the point of view of what God has said in his word. And the conclusion is that the answer to the question, what must I do to be saved, is the answer that the Philippian jailer received, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And there is nothing to be added to that. The grace of God is sufficient for both Jew and Gentile. We sang, your gospel, O Lord, is the hope for the nation. Your gospel and nothing else. James goes on and says, in order to, to um, avoid problems in the church, it's going to be necessary for us to give some advice to the Gentiles on how to behave. Because there were um, things within their culture and that had become really tied into Gentile culture that were wrong, such as the offering of foods to idols and so on. And that's why, um, uh, why, that's why that is there. They need to break and come away from these cultural things. But what must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. But I just want to take a few more minutes to, to share with you something that God has shown me out of this. And, and something that I read elsewhere at about the same time. The, the, you, some of you will have heard of R.T. Kendall. I know he's spoken at some of the Worship Academy um, weekends. Great Bible teacher. And he said this, that he longs for the day when the people of God get the Word of God and the Holy Spirit of God faithfully combined together in their lives. Because he believes that when that happens, we will see the church in victory. And that's what we see in this council of Jerusalem. We see Peter bringing the Holy Spirit of God. And we see James bringing the word of God. And it coming together. And the 
The answer that is arrived at is not arrived by a committee sitting there having a vote. And then being sent away again because there's no overall majority or whatever and come back and try again. The decision is arrived at through the Spirit of God and the Word of God. And we need to get those together. I enjoy reading, reading books, novels, that type of thing. One thing that I particularly enjoy is going and hearing authors of some of my favourite books talking about how they write them. It gives you an extra insight. The toppings over at Ely, and we've had some in Wisbeach as well, arrange talks from authors about books they have written. Um, and it, it gives you a different slant on the book as you read it. Um, and as you hear how they go through, through the writing process. Um, you know, when we read the Bible, the author is with us. That's why we can say things like, I've read that passage lots of times before and I never knew that was there. Because the Holy Spirit takes it off the page and smacks you between the eyes with it. And says, look at this, because this is what I want to say to you at this moment. Jesus said, along with sending the Holy Spirit as a comforter, that when this Holy Spirit comes, he will teach you all things. And one of the ways, the main way that the Holy Spirit teaches us is through the Word of God. And we need the two together. And let me say this to you because this is so important. The Holy Spirit will never, ever, ever contradict the Word of God. He cannot. It's an impossibility. And so we are taught by the Spirit and we are taught by the Word. But that isn't all that Jesus said about the Holy Spirit. He said to his disciples, wait in Jerusalem because you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And the Holy Spirit brings power and the Word of God brings power. In Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. The word of God is powerful. The Holy Spirit brings power. It's a double blessing. Something that came, I think within the last or previous election, a double whammy. Yes? You've got the Holy Spirit of God and the Word of God. It's a double portion. But there's more than that. I've been reading this book recently called Risk Takers by, by Malcolm Duncan. He's got some very good illustrations in there and I can't do better than these, so I'm going to pinch them. And he talks about the difference between the early church and the Holy Spirit and the church today and the Holy Spirit. And he uses an illustration, an analogy of a car. And he said, what we want, what the early church wanted, was the Holy Spirit in the fuel tank. We want the Holy Spirit power. But the difference between the church today, he believes, and the early church was that in the church today, we still want to be in the driving seat. Controlling the steering wheel. Controlling the accelerator pedal. Yes? He says, what we need to do is we need to get out of the driving seat and let the Holy Spirit in there as well. And he changes the illustration. He has a different picture. But he says that in the early church, the picture he presents there is the early church holding on to the, desperately to the coattails of the Holy Spirit as it leads them on from one situation to another. We need to get out of the driving seat 
Yeah, it's good to get that, just read you some bits of Acts. After I'd, see, after I'd read that illustration, just read you some bits of Acts. Yes, you can see it. The Holy Spirit is leading them. You know, we talked about Paul and Barnabas, and the Holy Spirit says, set apart Saul and Barnabas to the work which I've called them. And the church said, we'd better have a meeting about this. Because have we got a policy about two elders having a sabbatical at the same time? No. What did they do? They continued to fast. They continued to pray. They laid hands on them and told them to go. Because the Holy Spirit, not the church, was in the driving seat. We need the leading and guiding of the Holy Spirit. We need the leading and guiding of the Word. We've already said we need the power of the Spirit. We need the power of the Word. We need the teaching of the Spirit and the teaching of the Word. But there's more. Have you noticed how we've got there's always more? Yeah, don't worry, it's my last point. When we think about the power of the Holy Spirit and the power of the Word in Acts, what do we think of? Perhaps we think of the miracles. Perhaps we think of the healings, the answers to prayer. The prison gates opening. And yes, that's right. But there's another power as well. And there's another power that's operating today. And that is the transforming power of the Spirit and the Word in your life and in my life. Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 18 and we who with unrevealed faces all reflect the Lord's glory are being transformed into his likeness with ever increasing glory which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit and the Spirit at work in us the power of God's Holy Spirit at work in each one of us will transform us and make us more and more and more like Jesus as he grows the fruit of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And then we have Romans chapter 12, where it says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. How do we get our minds renewed? By getting into the Word of God. And so it's another double whammy. The transforming power of the Spirit, the transforming power of the Word. Changing our way of thinking. Making us more like Jesus. We sang about the potter and the clay. Amen. Matt sang a song, and I think it was the one for Keith on, on Friday night. Which says, don't stop changing me. Now, even when it's hard. Even when it's tough. Even when I'm digging my heels in, Lord. Don't stop changing me. Now the Bible tells us, doesn't it, that God accepts us as we are. Yeah? But when I look back to what I was, I'm glad he didn't leave me like that once he'd accepted me. Don't stop changing me. We need the Word of God and we need the Holy Spirit of God working together in our lives. We need to get into the Word of God so that the Word of God gets into us. We need to spend time with God so we recognise the voice and the leading of the Holy Spirit. Now Paul and Barnabas didn't say, are you sure this is the Holy Spirit? They knew. They recognised the voice. You know, out there, you know, we've been talking about the mission field out there, we've got our map, yeah? Out there on the front line, which is where we spend most of our time as Christians, we need to be in tune with the Word of God. We need to be in tune with the Spirit of God. And if we are, and I believe I've just scratched the surface this week, we will see what God will do in us, and with us, and through us. 
and we will see God at work in the lives of the community around about us. And as he transforms us, he will transform our community.